Freedom's the answer. What's the question? You are listening to Ernest Hancock. Ernest Hancock and Ivan Eland from the Independent Institute, independent.org. You know, I, I we went through this before. Those of us that are old enough remember the Newt Gingrich came out. It's the same guys, Newt Gingrich, uh, DeLay, uh, uh, Dash. I mean, same people, same people, same, 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 same. They came out uh, six weeks before the midterm elections in 1994 after the 92 big Ross Perot uprising of the peoples. What happened was Frank Luntz is now a pollster working with Fox all the time and everything. He was a pollster for Ross Perot. And he went around to all these United We Stand groups and forums and everything. And he said, hey, you know, give me give me your focus group kind of what what phraseology do you like? What issues are good? What's bad? What do you and they took that and they go, okay, midterm elections. See, this is what we promise y'all. We're gonna do this contract on America or with America, whatever. Depends on your perspective. So they go in and they say, these are the things that we promised to bring to the floor. And do. I don't think they really passed anything. I think they did away with one T inspector for $135,000 out of New York or something. I mean, seriously. So I go, all right. Six weeks before the midterm election, you have the big Republican revolution. It sweeps in. They get control. And, uh, you know, whatever happens. And we got blue dresses that we got to deal with. Then we get into the 2008 Ron Paul revolution. That goes around. You get people all worked up and everything. They go, oh, we got to do this again. Same people. You get the Tea Party Express. You get Sarah Palin. You get, here comes Newt again. You know, he's, I'm going to run for president. And they had the, there was a promise to America, promise with America, whatever. And I, and it's hard to find. I mean, you don't see it mentioned much. I think everybody knew. You go, didn't we go through this before? You know, six weeks before midterm and here we go again. Well, what happened? Well, it worked once. I guess he'll do it again. Well, part of that was, you know, a missile defense system they were going on about. I remember hearing this, you know, strategic, you know, defense initiative, you know, the, the space war, or well, the Star Wars program and so on. Then they say, oh, we're going to have to support the troops, more war. Then they're going, you know, the missile shield, more war. Then they say we got to enforce sanctions in Iran, not on Iran or around Iran or about Iran. In Iran. I'm like, yeah, what, did APAC get to write this thing or something? So I'm going, what the heck is going on that when we get into this new Congress that's going to be there in Senate, the Tea Party movement, you know, are they uh, really what it started off being was the, the people or did it get co-opted? I mean, what, what's, what's going on in your opinion there, Ivan? Well, I think there are... The Republican establishment is trying to co-opt the Tea Party, and not only the congressional leaders. You see Dick Armey, he used to be um, uh, majority leader of the, of the House when the Republicans were in previously under Gingrich. Uh, and so, you know, the, uh, um, uh, you know this, is, this, uh, truck, this co-optation, and I think basically your point also about war is very Key because Madison said that, you know, warfare is uh, is the thing that all government um, uh, excesses stem from, whether it's spending or anything. And I think that's one thing. I think the Tea Party has good intentions of cutting the budget. And as you point out, they the, the people rise up and want to cut the budget. But then it never seems to get cut. And one of the reasons is because I think the Tea Party doesn't understand the root causes of big government. And the root causes of big government, in fact, the nation state was created because war got too big for the feudal kingdom. So uh, what happens is first you get the warfare state, and then you get the welfare state. And all of our social programs, or at least most of them, have originated in war. For instance, Social Security, which is one of the bigger entitlement programs, uh, originates way back at the Civil War pensions. And then they started giving Civil War pen, uh, families pensions of the, of the uh, veterans. Of course, it gradually, over time, uh, um, created the, social, the demand for the Social Security system. Another thing is employer-based health care. Uh, in World War II, you had price controls, and the price controls uh, prevented companies from paying people more to attract them to come there. So they started 
being, uh, you know, putting out health care benefits so that they could attract uh, uh, more employees because they couldn't raise their wages. So that's how we got the employer-based. I mean, if you, st- if you stop to think about it, it's a little bizarre for your health insurance to be connected to your job. Why, why would it necessarily have to be? Uh, why is your employer providing it? Well, that's the reason. Uh, federal daycare started when the men were at the front, the women were in the factories during World War II, uh, so the federal government started getting into daycare. And so you've got all these social programs that originated in warfare. And, and during warfare, there's always log rolling. The, the one party supports the other, other party's war. If the, uh, if, if the other party gets, the opposition party gets freebies. And the Republicans get it as much as the Democrats. Yeah, so no, let's put- stop right there. I want to I talk about that for a little bit. We always see this. A good example is uh, the 06 uh, mid um, elections that where you had the Democrats come in and they're going to stop the war. Pelosi, Speaker of the House, they go in and they keep extending it. They keep voting for funding more war. You have Obama comes in and he's, you know, I might want to be the peace guy. You know, pace. Well, you know, more war. Expands it. Yemen, uh, Pakistan. We got all kinds of stuff happens. So I'm going, what is the deal, and who's making the deal? I mean, you're, you're, you spent time in Washington. I mean, you were, you know, uh, knows the grindstone on this stuff, and I need to understand. It's like you're saying, well, okay, well, you get this, and we'll do this. Who's really running the show there? I mean, I understand you got special interests, and you got Israel, and you got money here, and you got this and that and whatever. But, I mean, you know, is there absolutely no connection to the people anymore? I mean, is that safe to say? Well, I think that's a large part of it. People vote for change, and you saw them vote for change in 2006 and 2008 because they were fed up with the Bush administration. And then in 2010, you saw you saw them vote again for change significantly. Only this time, they're voting against the Repu- the Dems. And it's quite strange that if you look at the actual policies, you have conservative in quotes George W. Bush, and you have liberal in quotes Barack Obama. But a lot of their policies, including uh, bailing out companies and banks and everything uh, and, do, and uh, prosecuting wars, are much the same. So you have all this. It's interesting. The media covers all this uh, partisan rancor. But below the surface, the parties are colluding, much as two giant companies that have that, uh, two oligopolies that control a market. Uh, they don't overtly say, hey, we're going to charge this price or that price. But under the table, they're, of course, doing that. And I think what you're seeing, we have our two-party system. Uh, Americans are curiously uh, proud of our free market system where there's much competition, and I'm proud of it, too. But then when they get to the political system, they're curiously proud of a system that has only two parties and two choices, basically. All minority parties come up uh, periodically, but then they get rubbed out by the, the way the system is structured. So... You have two parties, and they pretend to compete, but they actually collude. And if you look at the policies, uh, and, and in particular, the last two cases, George W. Bush and Obama, you see a, a striking similarity in, in policies, both uh, foreign policies and uh, domestic policies. Well, I, I, I need something explained to me. I mean, come on, man. I mean, you were there. How long were you in Washington working on policy and such? Well, I'm still in Washington. I worked for Congress for 15 years in various uh, capacities, and now and then I've been in the think tank world since then, and at Cato uh, Cato um, Institute and at Independent Institute. And so, uh, you know, I've seen it from all different directions. And the way that Washington is a very cynical place, and what you do is you 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 everyone is Washington is largely a PR shop, uh, both in government, outside government, of various groups. And what they're trying to do is spin whatever they're doing. And, uh, you know, if you get the spin and you can convince the, the people that you, what you're doing is correct, uh, or at least so that they don't uh, vote you out, then you've done your job. So it's, okay, it's now let me tell you what I... Manipulation of public opinion. Well, let me tell you what I want to talk about when we come back. Do they really have a fear of us voting them out, or is the system just rigged? Do they, you know, are they really worried about us or they're just trying to keep uh, the guillotines lines from forming? I mean, I, I need to understand their mindset because it doesn't seem like they're afraid and they need to be afeared.